All right. Um, I know every, I think I know everybody here, but um, I'll still introduce myself anyway for those watching on delay. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong Vermont. And welcome to Brain Club. Um, we're very excited for, we're excited for all of our brain clubs, um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly excited because we're, we're joined by um, some community panelists uh, to, to lend some other perspectives on our topic. So today we will be talking about reimagining education. All month long, we're talking about life reimagined, and um, this this is um, uh, uh, yet another domain of 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 things that we can reimagine. So, um, uh, by by way of introduction, I always like to review this, um, uh, whether whether it's your first spring club or not. Um, all forms of participation are okay here. You can have your video on or off, and even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. You know, don't need to look at the camera, move, stim, eat, fidget, whatever. Um, and you can communicate however however is is uh, most comfortable for you. Unmuting, typing in the chat box, mix, mixing and matching. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, one of the other um, uh, things that we do to protect one another's access needs, um, that we, um, you know, we, we, I don't know why this is a duplicate. I don't know why this is a duplicate at all, but uh, <laughs> things that are not on this slide um, are that um, we, we create a, a climate of, of just discretion so that people of all ages um, can, can, um, can participate. And so just keeping in mind that we may have little ears listening in terms of language and topics and all the things. Um, and one more bit of access need um, uh, housekeeping is that closed captioning is enabled. Um, we just need you to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, either the live transcript CC, or um, if you don't see that, the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles or hide subtitles if you'd like to turn it off. All right, um, um, a couple couple more news pieces before we head into our topic. Um, tomorrow, even though it says Thursday, just noticed this for the first time. This has been all over social media without realizing that it's the wrong day. Wednesday, January eighteenth. Uh, tomorrow is our monthly youth and family lunch and learn series. Tomorrow we'll be talking about kids, video games, and angst, reframing to unlock more peace. And this gets um, this gets recorded if you can't make it live. Um, and so actually, if, if, if one of our ABB staff members can put the link in the chat for registration, if you're interested in that, that'd be awesome. And then lastly, last but not least, we are uh, two weeks away from the conclusion of our reimagining what's possible campaign. Um, this is uh, if if you're if you're new to this, this is we have an opportunity because of a generous donation from a one of our community members. Um, match twenty five thousand dollars. So as soon as it becomes twenty five thousand, it will become fifty thousand, which is um, just unthinkably magical. So um, this is um, how we're able to offer all of our community social programming um, at not, no cost to participants. And so we, if, if, um, if you're able to help us spread the word, um, that is super, super impactful. So thank you for, for helping us spread the word. All right. Tonight, reimagining education. We're going to do some, like, just some background about what's not working in 2023. Um, does 22,000 become 44,000? Yes, yes, it does. So we're already, we're already there. Thank you, David, for the question. Um, um, Sarah Wilkins, our community programs coordinator, who is also um, the, uh, the lead advocate for the state of Vermont for, the, for Lives in the Balance, which we'll talk more about, um, who will, will introduce us to the collaborative proactive solutions model. Um, and um, We'll introduce our panelists. We've got um, three educators um, who will be sharing their perspectives um, on, on, on how they see the world. And we'll have lots of time because I know there's there's several other educators in the audience tonight. And we look forward to hearing 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 from, from everyone. Um, lots of time for discussion tonight. 
So this quote from Alfie Cohn, anytime educators or parents frame the issue in terms of the need to change a child's behavior, they are unwittingly buying into a larger theory, one that excludes, um, one that exudes what many of us would argue are the things that really matter. The child's thoughts and feelings, needs, perspectives, motives, and values. The behavior is only what's on the surface. And in 2023, um, many systems are embedded in um, a paradigm centered around behavioral modification and compliance. And um, when we think about um, the ramifications of this behavior without looking beneath the surface, we are miss we're not only missing an opportunity, but we have many unwanted consequences. In the state of Vermont, 587 kids are secluded or restrained annually. More than 5,500 kids are suspended from school for behavior issues annually. And when you zoom out and look at US statistics, 98,000 kids physically restrained or secluded. This is shocking to me, shocking and appalling to me. So Sarah, I'm gonna just um, I'm I'm gonna stop talking um, and let you let you comment on this and and introduce us to another another paradigm. Sure. So um, I first learned about Dr. Ross Green about five years ago when my oldest was about five years old. Um, he's an American clinical psychologist from. Um, Harvard, and um, he was trained in behavioral modification and um, went through the traditional training that a lot of um, doctors and psychologists and teachers go through. Um, and at some point, he just started to notice that the advice that he was being told to give parents wasn't working. So um, when he was asked kind of what tip the scales in terms of his, you know, approach, um, that's what really um, shifted things for him was that he kept saying to, um, to parents, you know, just put them in a timeout, like they need to be in a timeout and it wasn't working and the behaviors weren't improving and all it was doing was damaging the relationship. So it was at that point that he started to re, uh, reevaluate some of his training and look at what was starting to come out about neuroscience and the importance of connection and the importance of relationship. And um, eventually after many years of um, you know, digging through research and doing his own research, developed a model. And the model is called Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. Um, and he is based out of Portland, Maine now. And he has a board of directors and a, a nonprofit organization that was created um, that's called Lives in the Balance. So um, it's, it's really amazing the work that he's done uh, since that organization was formed. Um, with all kinds of kids, with kids that really need a lot of help, and also just supporting schools in the state of Maine um, and supporting families. Um, so all different types of people seeking support for behaviorally challenging kids. Um, but the thing about CPS is that <clears throat> it's a model that's valuable for any age. So it's not just a, a parenting strategy. It's a method of communication similar to nonviolent communication in terms of 
um, being a, a way to really hear the other party's concerns um, and put everything out on the table. And um, <laughs> Mel is saying that she uses CPS to communicate with her husband. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really valuable uh, method of communication. Um, and it, so anyway, I'm going to start by sort of breaking down the basics. Um, for the full information, I would recommend going to the website, which we listed in the chat. Um, cause there's, there's, he does, you know, multiple days of training or weeks of training on this model. So this is going to be like the really zoomed out, very cursory view of it. Um, the first thing to know that's not in this slide that I'll just say about CPS is that you have to change your lens from one to, of looking at a situation, a person, whether it's a child or another uh, adult, uh, from looking at the other person as, you know, they would do well if they wanted to to they would do well if they could, but they can't. Something's getting in their way. So there's some lagging skills and there's some unsolved problems here. And that's what CPS does is it starts to break down the behaviorist paradigm of, you know, this kid's just giving me a hard time because they, they just don't want to do the thing um, and pulling away from that. Uh, that view. So um, the three plans that um, Dr. Green talks about um, in terms of explaining the CPS model, plan A is what we're trying to get away from. Okay. So plan A is the mainstream model, currenting, cur many current, uh, you know, parenting quote unquote experts, uh, top down, solve the problem unilaterally. You're going to do this because I told you to do it and I'm going to reward you or I'm going to punish you accordingly. So that's plan A. So that's how uh, Dr. Green explains that. Plan B is really what CPS is about. In plan B, um, you're solving the problem collaboratively. So you're equal partners in looking at this problem and trying to solve it together. Um, plan C is just setting the problem aside for now. It doesn't mean that um, you're dropping that expectation completely. It might just be that you're triaging the situation and there's a lot of problems that need to be solved. And this one, we're just going to put aside for right now. So there's four important themes of plan B. The first is that the emphasis is on the problems and solving them rather than on the behaviors and modifying them. Pretty much speaks for itself. Um, the second one is that the problem solving is collaborative rather than unilateral. So like I said in the last slide, it's something you're doing with the child rather than to them. The third is that problem solving is proactive rather than emergent. This is probably the most important part besides the fact that it's collaborative, that it's proactive. So it's not done in the heat of the moment. This is not uh, there's an explosion, a meltdown, things are getting really hard, and I'm going to solve this problem right now. It's noticing when the problems happen, starting to take note of, you know, what's happening, not just right before the behavior, but what's happening, you know, a while before the behavior, in the bigger context of, of life, where is this kid at, or where is this adult at? Um, and being proactive and having conversations when things are calm and quiet and peaceful. Um, and the fourth is that um, understanding comes before helping. Indeed, understanding is the most important part of helping. So um, when you're trying to solve a problem using um, CPS, the first thing to do is to go to the Lives in the Balance website where there's something called the ALSUP. And the ALSUP is the Assessment of Lagging Skills and Unsolved Problems. So it's a very well broken down uh, chart to kind of document um, what are some areas that um, a child might be struggling and if it's a kiddo or an adult um, and trying to kind of take take down information and that's where that's where you're going to start to identify which which problems you want to try to solve now and which ones uh, you're maybe going to put on hold for right now. 
So once the ALSEP is completed, then it's time to sit down with the child and to solve some of the most pressing problems or the most pressing problem. So the, this is the, the three steps to CPS, um, the real Reader's Digest version. <laughs> So the first step is called the empathy step. So when you're doing the empathy step, you want to sit down um, and have a conversation about getting information. So we adults, as Dr. Green likes to say, are theory machines. We like to think that we know exactly why a kid is doing what they're doing, and we really have no idea. So in the empathy step, we're getting information from the child's perspective or from the other person's perspective. So this might look like saying something like, I've noticed it's difficult for you to brush your teeth before bed at night. What's up? And after that, the child is going to share their perspective or the other person's going to share their perspective. And it's really about active listening, summarizing what they tell you and not jumping in with your opinion. So you're really just listening, repeating back what you hear. The second part is to define the problem. So this is where you're saying the same concerns that you would have said in plan A, you would have said, well, you have to brush your teeth because this is why you have to do it. Um, and, and I'm gonna reward or you know punish you. But instead of doing it with that kind of energy, when you're defining the problem in CPS, you are stating it in a way that doesn't doesn't cause the other person to kind of have that wall go up. So you're collaboratively finding a solution that's going to work for both parties. So this is where the, the adult or the, the person who's bringing up the problem gets to share their perspective. So you might say something like, the thing is, I'm concerned if you don't brush your teeth that, da, 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 da. you know, this is where you fill in what your concerns are. Because it's not about letting the other person just get their needs met. This is very similar to what we talk about with All Brains Belong with access needs, what each party needs in order to meaningfully participate. And so this is the opportunity to kind of have that conversation and, um, and talk about what are your access needs? These are my access needs. Um, the third part of the step is the invitation. So this is where um, you are trying to find a solution that works for both parties. Because if you don't find a solution that works for both parties, the problem is unsolved. So if you come up with a solution and it has nothing to do with what the child's concerns are or the other person's concerns, that's not a solved problem. Um, so you would say something like in this scenario, I wonder if there's a way that we could still make sure that you brush your teeth at night, but also, and this is where you're gonna put your child's concerns in or the other person's concerns. Um, and the idea is that the solution, again, is mutually agreed upon. And then at the end, clarifying with the other person, you know, saying something like, would that work for you? And you can always try on a solution for a while and see how it works. And you can come back to it. It's not a definitive, like once and done kind of thing. And um, so, you know, again, this is a real cursory uh, view of CPS. Um, but just to give you a sense for the model, um, and I would really encourage you to go to the Lives in the Balance website to kind of learn more. Um, but it's 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 really incredible to see how um, schools that have implemented this model have reduced or eliminated the need for restraint and seclusion. Um, there are schools that were interviewed in Maine where a special educator was saying we were having, you know, situations daily to the point of needing to call in authorities and I mean a really messy situation um, and that just really drastically was reduced because of CPS and it's really about um, proactively looking at what can be done ahead of time not in the heat of the moment. Um, and it it, uh, it, it it seems like a lot of steps. It, it's, it, you know, it's putting in the time up front, though, so that you're not having to put in the time uh, with a really damaged relationship and a kid that really doesn't feel good about themselves or another person that doesn't really feel good about themselves afterwards. Thank you, Sarah. And as sure. soon as I can figure out, there we go. All right, Zoom motor planning, you know, my least favorite thing. 
So um, with, with, with that, um, I'd love to introduce our community panelists. Um, I'll introduce you together. Um, and then, um, you know, you can, you can tell us how you view the world and then we'll open it up for, for questions and discussion. So um, in, in, let me just, hold on, let me, I can't talk and figure out Zoom motor planning at the same time, add spotlight and Anna, where are you? There you go. Add spotlight. There we go. Oh, oh my goodness. That'll be the hardest thing I do all day. Anyway. Um, so that was very um, Brian, <laughs> say that, say that again. That was impressive. I've never <laughs> spotlighted before. I'm, I'm very impressed. <laughs> you. <laughs> um, so um, Jen Bryant is a special educator at Union Elementary School in Montpelier. Melissa Anderson is also a special educator and socio-emotional learning teacher at Union Elementary in Montpelier. And Anna Howes is an educator and a family coach in private practice. Um, so um, in, uh, you, 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 I don't know who wants to go first, but somebody go first. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. I can go. I just because I think mine connects. I mean, I'm sure all of us are going to say things that connect to what Kelly just shared. But um, part of my, well, most of my job is essentially like a teacher coach. This year, my job has looked different every year that I'm at school. But this year, it's really exciting because um, I'm using this CPS type model to train teachers about classroom management. Um, so I go into all the grade level team meetings once a week and share tips and tools for them to um, implement during the week. And then I also go in and model lessons and model interactions with the children. Um, and the one thing that we're focused on this week, um, which is something I talked to Mel about, um, and she said this fits right in with Brain Club, um, was the using the lens if you are looking at behavior um, through the Ross Green um, quote, kids will do well if they can. Um, so looking at a, a behavior as not a child won't do what you're, what you are trying to get them to accomplish, but that they can't because there's some sort of barrier in the way. So, you know, the mindset with those two different approaches, won't versus can't is, you know, on the won't side, the mindset is pretty judgmental, you know, that you may view the child as willful, defiant, um, and maybe your thoughts about that child, they're, they're lazy, they want attention, they're doing it to get back at me. Uh, and then the response is, you know, traditional rewards and punishment. Um, and then the child ends up in frustration, guilt, shame. Um, so that's not necessarily a productive way to approach um, when a, a child is having a hard time. So if you look at the lens of the child can't, then you're thinking about the barriers getting in the way of them you know, doing what, what their peers are doing or doing what, you know, finishing a task. Um, so when you, when you think about that in the lens of can't, you're more curious. Um, you are looking like a detective. I, I hold up a magnifying glass sometimes to remind teachers like, get curious. And I say that to myself, get curious, ask questions, try to find out why this, this child is struggling in that moment. Um, and then your thoughts about the child may be, how can I help? How can I support? What can I do to help this child get back on track? Um, and the response is that you're finding and removing those barriers for them. Um, and then the, in, in the end, it feels better for you as the teacher. And it also feels better for the child because they feel supported and strengthened and heard. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at this week. And that's a lot to take in. Um, so I do it in little bits so that people are really understanding and practicing and using um, these methods. And I just have a couple quick examples and then I can pass it to someone else. But for example, today I was in a kindergarten classroom and they were doing this really fun project and the teacher showed how to do it. Um, and then she said, okay, you can all go to your seats and get started. And one little girl just goes, no, out of nowhere. And you know, we could have continued on that path, but I just looked at her and I said one word, why? <laughs> because everything was fine. And she started crying and said, I, I didn't get a chance to talk. And I said, well, what did you want to say? And she didn't even know. But then I said, well, what, tell me about your project, what you're going to do. And she flipped right around. You know, she got right to work, sat down. She just didn't feel heard. 
And if I hadn't caught that small no, I mean, it was kind of big, but, but it was just so surprising to me and out of the ordinary, instead of saying, no, we're getting up, move along, go to the table. I mean, that's forcing the compliance and not getting to the root of the problem. So I have lots of um, examples like that that I could share, but I don't want to take up all the time. Um, I'm wondering so. if I can follow in your steps here, because I often do this. I am really fortunate to work with Melissa. And so we often go in and have meetings where I say, close the door. We need to confer for a few minutes. And I often follow her into these classrooms. So this kindergarten classroom, I think I might, was it turkeys that you were working on in this classroom? So I often follow her in and um, work in her steps. Um, one student, in fact, that I'm assuming she was in there to work with had a really successful time with these turkeys. And it's nice to remind teachers, um, isn't it great that he had such a good time doing this? He is such a hands-on learner. I'm so glad that you noticed that and did this project. And so I think oftentimes teachers need just as much. And Mel, you mentioned that you talked to your husband using this, same, and my kids. Um, and I often also talk to other adults that I think need a little bit of guidance by having this kind of be collaborative problem solving together. Um, my role is often working with students who are um, needing a little bit more support. So I work with students who are working with a lot of other adults. And so I am also doing some of what Melissa is doing while also working with the students where I'm talking to adults about it's not that they don't want to do this. It's possibly that they can't. Like, let's find out what that lagging skill is and let's work on that lagging skill. Melissa said something so amazing this morning and I wrote it down, but then um, one of the paraprofessionals that I work with was feeling really frustrated today. And I said, here's some great reading for you. And I think this is something that would be really helpful. And I handed her that paper, but it was that idea that compliance is something that we use in an emergency or when there's danger involved. So when we expect compliance, it should be because it's something dangerous. So the example was putting on snow pants. And what if a student says that they won't put on their snow pants? And you say, well, why? Again, Melissa gave such a great example of this, why? Because you might get wet, like why should you wear your snow pants outside? And if they don't want to, great. There's a logical consequence that follows and we protect our kids from so many risks that they no longer know how to take safe risks. And so this gives them that um, this time and this safe space to take those little risks and really make that work and learn what works, but also to be part of the problem solving solution. And then lastly, I'll say that I think of um, some of the students that I work with who have demand avoidance. And oftentimes we call that pathological demand avoidance. There's all sorts of things. But when we think of it as proactive demand avoidance, sometimes they're moving away. And Mel, I think I've used that language with you as well, because that's just how I look at it. They're moving away from that demand avoidance because it feels dangerous. And when you remove that power struggle from the equation, there's no longer that danger that keeps them from those elements of safety that they look for at school when they look for that safety connection and regulation are like those three key things that we need before students are accessing their education at all. So removing that power struggle, removing that demand and making this a collaborative case for each student allows you to get to know the student, allows them to get to trust you and really allows them to learn overall. I talked for a really long time. Sorry, go. I'm going to pass to the next person. Thank you. I I, I think this worked perfectly because I totally want to pick up right where you left off. Um, and I'm also so passionate about this. It'll be hard to only talk for five minutes, but I'm going to do it my best. Um, so I wanted to start with just like what changed my perspective about this because, um, you know, I was a student who didn't get gold stars. I was a student who like rewards and punishments never really worked for me. I try, I, I ran under the radar quite a bit. Um, but when I became an educator and I was in college to learn to be a teacher and I was so passionate about it and I was then learning these same models that didn't work for me as a child, um, it was interesting to feel what it felt like to have to replicate these um, systems in order to 
graduate college. Like I had to create rewards charts and I had to create, you know, systems where tables got points for doing, you know, good things. And the tables that didn't get the points, didn't get the ice cream and, and all these things. And I, I thought about how it made me feel as a child. And then I, I really took in how it made me feel as an adult. Like it didn't feel good. I didn't, I wasn't creating that relationship and I picking up on the thread in the chat, like there wasn't a priority, a priority on building a relationship with my students. And that was really frustrating. And um, I became a parent really early as a, um, a young, a young parent kind of simultaneously as going through college. And then it was the same thing. Like I was using a lot of these ideas of um, consequences. And I watched one of Ross Green's quick videos on YouTube about consequences. And this is where you were kind of, um, Talking about that a little bit, Jen, like the difference between adult imposed consequences as opposed to natural consequences and things that occur naturally. Um, and so from there, I created this model that's a little bit more scientific. It's like, let's experiment together and see what the consequences are, because we forget that actually there's a lot of really positive consequences to things that we do. Um, consequences don't just mean bad things or punishments. Um, and so that was how I started to shift my language, um, because I was using a lot of language around consequences and taking away privileges. And I was able to start to shift as I became a scientist, like discovering things alongside my child and like creating that kind of cooperative experience. And from there, as an educator, I actually developed an after school program um, that was a uh, democratic cooperative classroom in which the kids came specifically. I, I held the space as a teacher specifically in mind with how do I get um, the students to collaborate on deciding what they learn and how we learn it and what's available and um, how we meet each other's needs. Um, and then along came my daughter and punishments and rewards just don't work for her, even in the slightest, you know, it was, she has such a great way of being so clear about her need for autonomy <laughs> and, um, and definitely has that demand avoidant, um, nature. And it was a huge eye opener for me. So, um, so I wanted to, to, to give just two, um, examples. One is, um, one of the things I really like is this idea of being proactive instead of being like emergent, having to be like in the moment and then be like, ah, now we have to do something about this, but how do you be proactive about it? My first example is actually an emergent example, um, but I leaned on a lot of these tools to support this family. So I was bike riding with a family and, um, you know, there wasn't a discussion about where we were going to go, but clearly this family took bike rides a lot. And it was my first time out on these trails and we got to a fork in the trail and the father said, oh, we're going, we're going to take a right. Let's go this way. And the four-year-old was destroyed. I mean, he just lost his mind. He was so upset. He couldn't even speak. And the father was just like, get on your bike. Let's go. I said, we're taking a right. And he just started, he just started riding away. And he told all the other adults, you just have to leave him there. And he'll, he'll start following us. And then this kid proceeded to get on his bike and ride while sobbing and crying and screaming, riding his bike and riding his bike. And this probably lasted for five minutes before the fathers turned to me and said, well, do you have an idea of what we could do about this? And I was like, I do actually. Um, <laughs> and so um, the, the, we were able to define the problem as adults while the child, the child didn't even want to get close to us. He was still sobbing on his bike and he had stopped a, a little ways away from us. And finally, the father said, I really wanted to show you the river. That's why we're going this way. And I have no idea why he's so upset. He clearly wanted to go take a left. <laughs> and I, and he said, but I can't just let him have his way. Like that wouldn't, we can't do that. You know, <laughs> then I'd just be reinforcing all of this bad behavior. Um, and so I encouraged him to do this thing, take a deep breath, take a moment, actually ask his child why he's so upset. You know, what, what was it in that moment of taking a right that got him, you know, made him flip his lid, got him so upset. And I said, and then from there, focus on the compromise, focus on how both of your needs can be met. 
And I didn't actually get to hear the conversation <laughs> because they kind of went and did their own thing. Um, but I watched as the nervous system started to settle. I watched as they began to connect and they came back and this four-year-old was beaming and he said, my dad wanted to show you the river, but I really thought we were going to the playground and I really want to go to the playground. And we can, there's a place where we can see the river on the trail on the way to the playground. So they like, they presented this compromise. It was so beautiful to see that the father's need of seeing the river, showing me the river and the child's need of going to the playground could both be met. And we turned around and we went to the left and we went back to the playground and we stopped and we looked at the river along the way. Um, and actually I'm remembering when I told Sarah, I was going to tell this story. Um, I wrote a song with the child when we got to the playground and I was going to look it up so I could, um, I recorded it as a voice memo and I had forgotten about it. Um, but I like to do that with children too, like make songs to help them express their feelings and to help things kind of sink in. Um, and we made a song, um, and the lyrics were something like, um, we can do it together the song, the song, the lyrics to the song were kind of repeating over and over again. We can do it together, you and me, and we can both, you know, basically be happy and we can do it together. And he was like, so elated. Um, so I'm not able to keep up to the, with the chat while I'm talking, but there was so much great things going on there. And I, I just want to emphasize this piece on, um, you know, emphasizing that the relationship takes priority over the outcome. Um, and that's one of the things that's been so important to me, even as I sit with my students or my children or um, support parents in being with their kids, that um, it's not, you don't, you don't go into this process and it's a three-step process. It's not that complicated. It's like, hear what they have to say, speak what, what your concerns are, and then work together to create a solution. And the most important thing is as the adult to not go in to that kind of conversation already with an expectation of what the outcome is going to be, because that will go be at a detriment to the relationship in that moment. And you may not get and the first conversation to something that's perfectly satisfying for you as an adult, right? Like you're going to get wet if you don't wear your snow pants. And they're like, I don't care. I like getting wet. And you're like, shit. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but you, you know, it's, it's really about the relationship. Like, can you still be there? Can you carry the snow pants outside? You know, not, that's not always possible as an educator, but like, can you be there um, to be that supportive person so that when they do get wet and the inevitable happens that you knew was going to happen, they're going to be upset and cold. <laughs> you can still be there as that settled um, nervous system to support them through learning that um, in real time. Um and, and Anna, you just, can I just yeah. step in for a minute? You said something about not expecting the outcome. I think equally important is not expecting or assuming you know what the problem is. Yes. Because I always have an idea. And then when I dig deeper, it has nothing to do with what I thought it was. So, you know, I think equally just not assuming that, that you know, you can figure that out. Oh, that thank you. Yeah, sometimes it's I'm hungry. And they finally say, I didn't eat breakfast in the entire time you're trying to solve all of these problems and sometimes the so other part of it is maybe not trying to solve all of the problems because yes. some of those problems don't need to be solved um and i want to add in because this gets a lot of adults hung up is that when a child acts out we take it really personally and when we start to take it personally, it's a lot easier to start making assumptions. And I saw that a little bit in the chat, right? This assumption that teachers will make like, well, they're just trying to get their way or they're, you know, there's like, it's, it, that's often because it's touched something in us that, and we're starting to take this personally and being able to say like, actually what the child is experiencing, the struggle that they're experiencing um, has nothing to do with me. It, this is about them. And the only way I'm going to know what the problem is, is really by attuning to them and asking them. Um, and um, so I, I have created a five module online course that really supports people in going through a lot more detailed steps, right? We've got the three steps that's really helpful, but all this stuff that we're starting to say around not making an assumptions and not taking it personally. And um, like, it takes a lot more skills. And I really appreciated Melissa that you talked about practicing this, like it takes a lot of practice. 
Um, and so my, my, my course takes parents through five modules. It starts with slowing down. And the second module is titled Building Trust. The third module is called Create Connection. And each one of these builds in games you can play and exercises you can do for yourself and um, different concepts to think about, especially this thing around being a scientist. I like to do that a lot, making observations, having a hypothesis, trying something out. If it doesn't work, that's okay. You've just discovered that your hypothesis was wrong. So you just have to make a new hypothesis. It's not a big deal. And you try it again. That's what scientists do all the time. Um, and then the last two modules are titled Independence and Success. So module four focuses on routines and everyday living, and module five focuses on positive outcomes and uh, around this, this piece around really being um, co-creative in um, finding positive solutions with your child. So thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. And there's a request in the chat if you could throw, I, I, I put the link to your website, but I, you. if you have a specific link to modules or, or, or course, et, et cetera, um, as a direct link, that would be amazing. And then um, a question in the chat um, opened up to the to the whole panel. It looks like Jen has 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 some ideas um, about language to use to, to, to like name um uh how like why why it appears that like um accommodations or dropping of the demand is being done for some students in a classroom i think the really big thing to point out here is that often it aren't it often it is not the kids that are feeling this way it's the other adults kids really get it they're noticing that kids need different things and one of the um, coolest ideas that I've heard out there just involves a pack of Band-Aids. And you bring someone in and you say, where are you hurt? And they say, I have a cut on my knee. And so you hand them the Band-Aid and say, put this on your knee. And then you say, everybody else come up and tell me where, tell me about the scariest time you got hurt is what it is. Where was your boo-boo? What happened? Where did it hurt? And like, oh, I fell and I hit my head. Well, here's a Band-Aid, put it on your knee. And, oh, I fell off my bike and I skinned my elbow. Okay, here's a Band-Aid, put it on your knee. And they start to say, well, why am I putting it on my knee? I hurt my elbow. I don't want it on my knee. And it just opens the discussion for why everybody needs something a little bit different. And I really think that's magical. There are so many others that it could take all day to go through how many different ways. But really, I think that in general, kids just get it. I love that. Um, I and I think you're you're so right. I think adults often bring in this like assumption that has the like the perspective and the like the brain rules, the internalized brain rules um, that you've acquired over time that you like you know project onto the kids, and it, it just isn't there. And we talk so much about unsolved problems when we're talking about this. And I think as adults, we look for problems and we feel like it's our job to solve them. And so we're looking at these things from this lens of what if this is a problem for these other students? How do we solve this? And sometimes it's not our jobs to solve it. It's our jobs to just sit back and listen and to observe. And again, as both of you have said, to be a scientist and see what's happening. Other questions or comments from from anyone in the audience? Do you hand, but then disappeared. Oh, I, I, I turned on my mute, off my mute. I don't know. Oh, go for it. Great. Um, I have struggled so many years with just the realm of education, like as a parent, as a student, as a professional in the district. Um, and we ended up pulling our child from school um, because he just, he didn't feel safe. And he told us that in multiple different ways. Um, and now we homeschool and we moved out of the district to, like to boot. We're like, you're homeschooling and we're leaving. Like <laughs> they will never, ever harm you again like we felt we had to leave to help him feel safe 
um, after a year of homeschooling and his brother going to the new school and kind of giving us feedback, um, he decided he wanted to try a couple classes. And so he goes to science and recess and art. And the, we actually just had a team check-in meeting today of which he's invited to, which never happened in the old district. Like they were just like, oh, he's a kid, you know, this will be boring for him. And we're like, oh yeah, talking about himself. Like, that's not the worst thing ever, but he participates now. And he was so, he was able to say, I don't know if I can trust you yet. I don't know if you're lying to me or not. And it was so huge and like gut-wrenching at the same time because I truly didn't understand the depth of how much he mistrusted school adults based on these well-meaning, good-intentioned, you know, one-size-fits-all strategies. You know, when you're talking about compliance being needed for safety, he was subjected to compliance tests after meltdowns. So he had to go around and apologize to anybody that he might've upset. And we didn't know that, obviously, we never would have approved of that. Like that's cruel, nobody could do that. Um, and I shared that with his new team today and they were just so floored. And I was like, this is why he's starting to trust you because that never would have even occurred to you. And they were like, why would it occur to anybody? <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know, I don't know. And something else was said about how, how hard you have to work with somebody else. Our fourth grade teacher used to comment, oh, he had a hard day or he had an easy day. And finally I called her out on it. And I was like, does that mean that, you know, oh, he had a hard day. And I was like, oh, does that mean that you had to work harder? because that's what I'm hearing, you know, that means that he needed more supports, not that he had a hard day, he needed more supports today than he did yesterday. And that's okay that that happened. And it's just, I'm so happy that there's more understanding behind behavior <laughs> and more work and effort being put into kids are no longer just seen and not heard. We're finally right. listening. And I think that's the important part is we're finally listening to a kid saying, Hey, I don't know if I can trust you or not. Right. Right. And only the kid gets to decide when they feel safe. Right. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for sharing, sharing that. Um, Laura. Thanks everybody. These were really great presentations today. Um, I have a question. We had an issue recently in our house where we had a collaborative plan related to getting some vaccines. And when we got there, the plan went out the window and um, it didn't go so well overall. I'm not really happy with how any of us responded in the mo moment, um, but we've had a lot of conversations since then about bodily autonomy and who gets responsibility for making choices about our bodies. And I'm wondering how you reconcile that with decisions that you are making about health and how to balance those things where you are giving power and you are giving decision-making and autonomy, but you're also making things safe. Totally. Um, so um, I, I can speak to that one. This, this is CPS can work so well for topics like this. You know, Sarah gave the example of brushing teeth in my example today in my house, because my my husband has COVID. Um, he's like isolated in a room, never to come out for 10 days. Um, but like I want Luna to be like stepping up her mast cell anti-inflammatory game to protect her immune system, and she is not having it. Why? Because I want her to to, to take these things. PDA, right? So naming the thing of, I am noticing that the more I want you to do the thing, you cannot do the thing. It's not a will not, it's a cannot. They cannot accept this. It does not feel safe because my energy is like all about power over. I like, I, I'll name the thing, but, but, but so, but I, I try to explain to her why I am energetically pushing my agenda 
I am worried about this. It is important to me about this because I love you. Um, let me know how else you think we can accomplish this. And um, she's like had some ideas about how, how she wants this to go. Um, and, and like transparently saying like, I believe in bodily autonomy and I love you. And I know that, you know, this, that, and the other thing is a health thing. And I worry that if not for the, anyway, like that's a lot of language, but like, as, in, and again, you have to be, you, your child has to be, or your other person has to be regulated. Um, like you have to have access. Um, I, in, in my house, we'll literally say like, do I have access to your cortex? Um, <laughs> Uh, because uh, 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 my cortex and your cortex have to having a conversation in, in my house. Rarely do two people have access to their cortex at the same time. And that's okay. But like, it does not make sense to talk about literally anything. If someone does not have access to their cortex, Anna, and then, uh, and then, and, and um, I'm, I'm reminding myself of, of Kelly's hand in the corner, but go ahead, Anna. Great. Great. I just wanted to give some like quick language here. So this is really the shift we be- between I'm the adult, so therefore you do what I say, to I'm the adult and my job is to keep you safe. How can you help me keep you safe? And so it it really shifts it away from that power over to that, like, let's be collaborative on this together. Like, I realize this is feeling really stressful for both of us. So the solution isn't whether or not you're going to do the thing. The solution is how can we do this with the most peace and love? Because that Also, I'm the adult and therefore my job is to love you. And so how can we do this in a way that makes us both feel loved and supported and safe? Um, You know, and so there's still a lot of autonomy and a lot of choice in that kind of language. And and one other thing, Laura, um, sometimes when in your specific example that you gave, when it's really, really hard to, to follow the plan for something that scary, you know, in your child's eyes, sometimes an external reward might be needed in in a situation where it's really hard to come up against that. So, you know, saying, well, let's do this and then we'll go out for ice cream or, you know, that, that in that case, a reward is, is um, is appropriate because when this child is having a difficult time accessing the skill, they need that little bump to be able to pull that, pull that in. Thank you. Kelly. I had just a a quick question for the special educators. You know, we live in kind of a crazy world. And one thing I come up with or come against a lot is trying to create a safe space for students, children to explore themselves. But when they Google things like autism or neurodivergence, some of the stuff that comes up is extremely harmful and the language that's used. And I think that we live in a world where people still don't even really know when they're using harmful language a lot of the time. And I was just wondering if you had any advice on ways to help students explore and learn about themselves in like a more uh, self-directed way while still protecting them. If I could just jump in, I think you can provide them with resources that are neurodiversity affirming and you can teach them the concept of brain rules and world rules. Um, You know, the idea that Um, There are people, and this doesn't have to just be about neurodiversity, this can be about gender, this can be about all kinds of things, that there are people who have some thoughts that are just wrong. That's part of the real world is that there are people out there whose thoughts are just wrong. Um, And to provide them with resources that are actually helpful. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat before I learned I was autistic and was uh, initially developing my monotropic focus on neurodiversity, I dumped a whole bunch of resources on a website, um, not knowing that not everyone does that (laughs) with their interests. Um, And uh, it has like a whole bunch of resources, including things that are like noted for, um, you know, kids and teens and stuff like that. (laughs) But I wonder if, if, if anyone else has thoughts about that.
I've actually seen your website, Mel. I've used um, I've used one or two of the resources in the the class that we're designing. I don't know. I guess I just feel like I don't want to censor the world, but I need to censor the world. So it's these two polar polar wants and needs that are competing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So like even my, I think you just bring transparency. It's not censoring. It's just naming. There are websites out there. You may see this. Like I have a, I have a teenage patient who after like actually in the the day that I made her diagnosis and was um, I played a I played a video as one of the um, agony Auti videos um, about what autism is. Um, I played the video, and then I said, "Let me tell you what you're gonna find when you Google," and named the thing. And she was like, "That's ridiculous." I was like, "I know." Um, so just like you're not, you know, you're just like, yeah. There's a lot of bad information on the internet. Let me teach you how to be an educated consumer of the internet. Like it goes so much beyond neurodivergence. It's just, there's a lot of crap out there. I love that, Mel. And I'll just jump in that when when you begin to use tools like the one we discussed tonight um, with students, they become like when, when you have a cooperative relationship with a student like that or with a child, your own child, um, it 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 builds the part of their brain that can be a critical thinker. So they can start to be able to filter through information that they're getting. And um, so I just want to say like, that's, that's what we're all doing together is like building a space in which children can um, learn and grow to, to discern for themselves, like what information feels true to them and what doesn't, because there's going to be continue to be a lot of adults in their life who say, do it because I said so. And um, you know, and they're, they're going to have, their um their own approach to handling that and they're going to be more successful when we give them tools like the ability to talk through and come up with collaborative proactive solutions that is so well said we'll probably have time for one more question jen Thank you. This was so amazing tonight. I, I can't thank everyone enough for their amazing input. Um, so I'm kind of shifting from the boots on the ground to, um, to way up at the top of state education departments in helping them understand what neurodiversity looks like in a classroom setting. Um, I am fortunate to have had the experience of being a former Board of Education member and teaching kids um, as a former special education teacher, gen ed teacher from kindergarten to 12th grade in, in knowing that this has to go from the bottom to the top and vice versa. And our leaders need to understand that every single classroom needs to have flexibility within teaching content because as we know, developmental skills and content are two very different things. How do we get them to understand all of this so we can make changes of having more support in the classroom, more language support, um, you know, more people pushing into the classroom so we can give every child what they need and meet their access needs. Um, I, you know, it's a conversation for another day and something to start thinking about bringing it all the way up to the top to get that change back down. Amen to that. And I think that you come at this from a really important perspective. You're, you are directly bridging the double empathy problem. So because when you come at people and you tell people that they're doing it wrong, they flip their lids, right? So you got to, so like you got to oblique approach it. And so, um, you know, universal design benefits all people. And so it's not, that, you know, and, and so that language, I, you know, I don't know I'm as a, but again, I'm not the person to deliver that because I'm not an educator. Um, and so it's, it's, it's that I think, um, because I don't know. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask all the educators um, in, in, in this virtual room, like, are there people 
who in in education who think that universal design is not helpful like i don't know the people like go around and say that's not helpful like it's just that you know it, it may not be the thing they're focusing on right now right i mean do i have that do i have that right laura I find it super, super helpful. I will say it takes me three times as long to create things when I'm trying to implement UDL versus doing it without it. I totally, I totally get that. I mean, even to say like brain club is not delivered via UDL, like, because we don't have that capacity. Um, we are working on, um, we discussed this at our last community advisory board meeting about creating visual handouts with take home points um, and that that's articulating the main ideas of of a given brain club in plain language, um, and so that's going to be something we're going to be rolling out in the in 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 this winter. Um, but it's it's, and I'm reading reading from Laura's comment. First year super hard. After that, way better. So you invest in you know you you create your systems and your tools, and then you you have things. But yeah, um, oh cool. All right, so Kelly has shared a link in the chat. I've got to tell you guys about this link. So this is like the chat GPT, but for educators. So you can put in what you want to teach and it will auto populate every like tons and tons of ideas how to do it. So it just saves a lot of that brain strain. What I'm going to do, um, because the chat is not, it won't come up on the YouTube station. Before we wrap up, I'm going to share screen and show the screen of this URL so that people can have that. App.educationcopilot.com. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much to Jen and Melissa and Anna. And thank you. Thank you to you all for being here. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week for Reimagining Employment.